So welcome to our 10th Naturalist Night for 2019, our 10th and our last week of the Naturalist Nights. That means the season's changing, the daylight savings time begin, or begins or ends? <laughs> begins very soon. And so th thanks for being part of this for this, uh, this winter. For the, uh, the Naturalist Nights program is a three-way partnership and is produced by the Wilderness Workshop and the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies and the Roaring Fork Audubon folks. And my name is Sarah Johnson and I represent the Wilderness Workshop. These have been happening every week and they're not going to continue next week, so I'm not going to tell you that they are. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now, we do have a tremendous number of sponsors, and those very generous sponsors, um, some of you might be here in the room. The cookies tonight come from the Village Smithy. And just so you know, every week the Two Leaves in a Bud has given us all the tea that we give to you, and the cookies all get given to us, and so today the cookies are from vil the Village Smithy. Also, our sp featured sponsor for tonight is um, Bristlecone Mountain Sports, based there in Basalt, or Willits now. These are all filmed by Grassroots TV, and they are all being live streamed as well on Facebook. And you can actually go to the Wilderness Workshop Facebook page and find all of this year's and maybe last year's videos as well, as well as all of on YouTube. So you have, an, you have access to plethora of couch movie watching material all year round. So thanks to Grassroots TV for doing that, as well as airing it on their regular TV channel, Channel 12 Up Valley and Channel 82 Down Valley throughout the year. You can possibly catch a naturalist night. Thanks for signing in yet again. And there's that special clip board back there for those of you who might need or want continuing education credit hours. So I will be making those certificates sometime in the next few weeks and be emailing you a certificate so that you can print it out and have it for your records. Um, so tonight, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm supposed to tell you, but tonight we um, thankfully, yet again, nature is exciting and makes getting speakers here a wonderful adventure. And thankfully, Highway 133 opened. It was closed over by the Peonia Reservoir in both directions for the last couple days. And so it opened, so Dr. David in a way, did not have to drive to Grand Junction <laughs> to get here. So he lives in Paonia. So Dr. David Inoue is our speaker this evening. He has worked with the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, or Rumble, over in Gothic since 1971. So Gothic, as you probably know, is just north of Crested Butte. And while there, he oversees one of the longest studies of the timing and abundance of flowering in the world, which he started in 1973. He has taught ecology and conservation biology classes at the University of Maryland, but now lives near Paonia while continuing his long-term research. He has served as president of the Ecological Society of America and on the boards of the North American Pollinator Campaign, the National Phenology Network, and more locally, the Citizens for a Healthy Community. He has worked with bumblebees, hummingbirds, ant plant mutualisms, and what may be the longest study ever of individual wildflower plants not only here in America and here in the Rocky Mountains, but also all over the world. And he just recently returned from a trip down to Argentina where they were looking at bees and, and um, invasive bees and so forth. So he's got lots of experience and we're thrilled to have him be the, the last big hurrah for our 2019 Naturalist Night series. So thanks, David. Okay, thank you for all uh, for showing up tonight, letting me uh, tell you some stories about the work that I do. And uh, just to sort of a geographical placemaker, show you where I work, uh, that's Gothic Mountain, and the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab is just on the other side of, of Gothic Mountain. And if you were to hike up the uh, Copper Creek Valley here and over the pass, you'd drop down in, uh, towards this direction. So it's not all that far away. Uh, from um, from where we are right now, and those of you that know Crested Butte ski area, there, there's Crested Butte Mountain. I, I was fortunate to have this view when I when I took a flight uh, 
into, I forget, Grand Junction or Montrose this fall. So what I want to talk about is the effects of global and regional climate change on the phenology of wildflowers and animals in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. That's sort of an overarching theme for uh, the, the work that I've been doing uh, for, this will be my 49th year working up at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. Here's kind of a roadmap for what I'll talk about. Uh, I won't say a whole lot about the global or regional climate because we all know that uh, the climate is changing, uh, but it's, some of this is, are things like the North Pacific Oscillation or the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, and there are a variety of these naturally occurring cycles that are ticking over at different, uh, with different frequencies. And they all interact to create the weather that we have here in the mountains in Colorado. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the effects of snowpack and snowmelt and also how that affects uh, frost events. Uh, but those all cascade down into effects on the phenology. Phenology, for those of you that might not be familiar with that term, refers to the, the timing of seasonal events. And the, uh, so I'm going to say a little bit about the phenology of migration and also the phenology of emergence of animals that spend the winter uh, underground. Um, talk about how snowpack and snowmelt dates affect flowering, the timing of flowering and the abundance of flowering, and then their interactions that uh, generate pollination and affect pollinators, and also uh, that in turn affects whether plants are making seeds and replacing themselves, the field of plant demography. So I'll, I'll try and fill in some stories about uh, about those boxes and arrows. And one slide I'll show for uh, global or regional climate is this one showing uh, the kinds of cycling that we see in the El Nino-La Nina switch, the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation. But there's also something called the Southern Oscillation, which is going on naturally, also the Pacific uh, Decadal Oscillation, it's sometimes called. So those, those are helping to create the kinds of, of weather patterns that we end up seeing here in Colorado. The global temperature, of course, is uh, getting warmer. Uh, we know that that's probably a consequence of the global carbon dioxide increasing. Um, maybe you don't know that the second longest running record in the world for carbon dioxide is recorded here in Colorado. At the, uh, it's actually up at the University of Colorado's Mountain Research Station, uh, where once a week, since the 1960s, uh, somebody has hiked or skied up to the ridge and filled a, a canister of air, shipped it off to have it analyzed. And so that's what's behind some of these numbers. And then there's also uh, interesting variation going on in how much snow we get and when it melts in the spring. And that's been particularly important for the work that I do. We know that that's changing. So for instance, here's some data from the Gunnison, Colorado weather station showing what's the ratio of rain to snow over time. Uh, and unfortunately, the bottom of that graph got cut off. But this goes uh, back to, let's see, this goes back to about, uh, about uh, 1900, actually. So this is a long-term record. But you can see that uh, in Gunnison, which is down at 7,600 feet, uh, that ratio is, is, has been changing for a while. If we look at Crested Butte, which is a little bit higher up, about 70, uh, 8,800 feet, uh, you can see that we, we reached kind of a tipping point here, uh, maybe about uh, the 1980s. And that ratio of rain to snow is, is now heading in a direction that uh, is not going to make the ski areas happy. Uh, I, I haven't worked up the data from Aspen, but I would presume that it's going to be pretty close to the story that we see here from Crested Butte. And that has an impact on, on animals, uh, including snowshoe hares. Uh, and there's actually been some science done now. It shows that uh, by virtue of changing white while the ground is still brown, uh, that makes the, the hares much more conspicuous to predators, which isn't too surprising, and that their predation rate goes up. So they're suffering the consequences of this change in climate. In short, then, uh, the environment is changing. The, there are changes in temperature going on, changes in precipitation, uh, increased variability in some of these measures of climate, 
Um, and those changes can happen at a variety of spatial scales, from all the way from global to regional to, to local. And that changing ecological environment is very important for this scientific field of phenology, of the timing of seasonal events. So uh, here's a picture of the, uh, the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab located here in the bottom of the East River Valley. Uh, this is Copper Creek, and uh, some of you who've hiked over from Aspen might have ended up coming down the Copper Creek Valley. Uh, the ski area is about, oh, four miles down the road this way. Um, this time of year, it looks pretty different. Uh, it looks about like this. Um, and on average, uh, we about 16 meters of snow falls, 16 or 17 meters of snow falls. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, on average, about 10 or 11 meters of snow falls. The range is up as high as 16 meters of snow. And when I checked uh, the website earlier today, uh, uh, it said that there was about seven feet of snow on the ground right now up, up in Gothic. So uh, here's Gothic Mountain. And that's the cabin that I work out of, out of during the summers. Um, this is how much snow has fallen in Gothic every winter starting about 1973, I think it is here. Yeah, this is the winter of 76, 77, which people in Crested Butte referred to as the winter of Un. Uh, and that was a winter that convinced Crested Butte and a number of other ski areas in Colorado that they'd better put in snowmaking so that they could open at Christmas time. This is the winter of 94, 95, which is uh, when I took this picture where the snow was about, oh, probably about eight feet on the ground uh, by the middle of spring. And so there's a lot of variation from year to year in how much snow we get. That has a variety of kinds of impacts. And you can actually see one of those impacts here on the aspen trees. So maybe you can see that the bark is much rougher down here. And that's because the snow got up that high, which allowed pocket gophers to, to burrow their way up into the snowpack and chew on the bark of the aspen trees. Um, so the trees recovered, but uh, that gives you some idea when you hike through aspen forests in the summer, how deep the snow was the previous winter or in some previous winter. So I, I make a lot of use of data that are collected by this friend and colleague, Billy Barr. Um, and he, ha he uh, was a research student out at the biological lab um, and liked it so much that as soon as he graduated from college, he moved out here and he's essentially never left. Um, and he's recorded every day or multiple times a day, uh, every winter since uh, the, about 1974, how much snow is on the ground, how much has fallen. Um, and that's been very important for the work that I do. Uh, he started getting a lot of publicity, uh, I think about three years ago, when somebody made a movie. And uh, the, the link is cut off there. But if you were to Google Snow Guardian, there's a short movie that was made about Billy and the data that he collects, how he collects it. and. Um, and then there's been an article in the Atlantic magazine and news crews from China and Germany and this spring from Denmark came out to interview him about his research or his data collection. So uh, these are his data showing how much snow has fallen in Gothic uh, starting about 1974-75 running up to the current. And so this is last year where we had so little snow. And somewhat arbitrarily, I've broken this into two time periods, one where it looked like the amount of snow that we were getting was, uh, despite all the variation, here's 76, 77, here's 94, 95, uh, that the trend was towards more snow over the winters. And then things have changed, and we now seem to be on a trajectory uh, towards less snow. And if you plot when that snow melts, so this is the first date of bare ground, uh, starting as early as the 26th of April in, in that winter of 76, 77, and as late as the 19th of June in that winter of 94, 95, um, it was May 5th last year. Uh, but the overall trend, despite all that variation, is that we're getting earlier snow, uh, earlier springs. 
somewhat arbitrarily, I also broke that data set into two time periods. And so it seems like uh, from, the, from the early 70s up until the mid 80s or so, uh, here was one, one long term average. And then we're sort of on a new lower trajectory here since then. And this makes one of the points that I want to, to bring home, which is the value of long-term data sets. So imagine, for instance, that, that I only had eight years of data. If I'd started this project, in 19, or he, Billy had started this project in 1995 and continued that for the next one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, how would you interpret that? I was pretty worried because it looked like after those seven years that snow was, was just becoming hugely uh, different from what it had been. And so I was somewhat relieved when uh, the next year things picked up a bit and, and now it looks like it may have been a, a step change here from a higher level to a lower level, but at least not falling off the cliff the way it looked like it was for those eight, eight years or so. so in order to put any one year, any one winter into context, you really need to have a long-term data set. And that's why it's wonderful to have uh, Billy Barr's data. These are his data from 74, 75 up to the present for uh, what was the day of the year when there was the first bare ground? When did snow melt at the site where he measures it? And it occurred to me to wonder, is there any way we could get that kind of information from what happened before Billy started recording data. So if you think about what happens to the snow up in Gothic when it melts, it runs into the East River. The East River runs downstream to Almont. There happens to be a US Geological Survey stream gauge in Almont, which measures how much water is there continuously. And it's done that back to the 1930s. So the, how much water they measure in terms of the peak amount of runoff at Almont each year. And when that peak occurs is very strongly correlated with how much snow was there up in the mountains and when did it melt. And so I was able to reconstruct what was the likely date uh, when the snow disappeared up in Gothic from the 1930s up into the 1970s. And you can see that it's not hugely different from, from what we've seen uh, during this period when Billy Bars measured it. Uh, we are seeing more years of early snow melt than there were back in the 1930s. And probably the latest snow melt date was uh, one that uh, nobody was measuring at that point. Why is the snow melting earlier? A couple of reasons. One is that it's warmer in the springtime. So this is a graph showing the, the mean or the average minimum April temperature. How cold is the average cold temperature in April? And it's it's uh, many degrees warmer now <clears throat> as a minimum in April than it used to be. So one of the reasons snow is melting earlier is because it's getting warmer. Uh, another reason, though, is related to something called dust on snow events. <clears throat> so this is a picture of the snow of the valley outside Crested Butte. And perhaps you can see that it's whiter up on the peaks where there was some fresh snow covering up the dirty snow that was uh, there previously. So where does that dirt come from that's uh, making the snow dirty? And how often does that happen? This is a cross section through a snowpack uh, down actually down near Durango where people have been studying this. And so each of these dark layers <clears throat> in this cross section of the snow is one of these dust on snow events. And where does that dust come from? This is a picture of outside Phoenix, Arizona, not uh, not in the winter. This is actually in, I think the date got cut off here. Uh, this was July 5th, 2011. And there's a dust storm approaching. Uh, so what we think is happening is that there's more disturbance now of the desert floor in the southwest than there used to be. That creates the opportunity for blowing dust. And this is a picture I took on a highway south of Tucson last fall where they warn about blowing dust. And that dust gets picked up and it gets blown up here into Colorado off of places like this. And so here's a, here's a screenshot of the weather forecast from the NOAA weather site uh, 
and this is from March 2012. And in that forecast for, uh, for Crested Butte, Colorado, is blowing dust. And that forecast was also forecast for Montrose, Grand Junction, Gunnison, Aspen, Telluride, also parts of Utah and parts of Arizona. So blowing dust is becoming more common and it creates all these dust on snow events and that completely changes how reflective is the snow, reflecting the heat back off of it or is it, absor it changes it to an absorbing pattern where it's absorbing heat and that makes the snow melt about maybe about 10 days earlier than it would have otherwise. This is actually a picture from February uh, taken here in the Roaring Fork Valley. This is, oh, I'm sorry, March 30th, 2014. So there's been about a 200% increase in the amount of dust recorded uh, on snowpacks. So if you look at what day do you get this peak runoff at Allmont, Colorado, uh, it also seems to have reached a tipping point uh, back in the uh, late 80s and now Peak runoff is happening earlier than it used to. And that has implications for agriculture, it has implications for fishing, it has implications for whitewater rafters or kayakers, um, but that's part of the changing environment that we're seeing now. So there's earlier snowmelt dates. This is the snowmelt date of year, showing that trend that despite lots of variation, the overall trend is earlier snowmelt. Uh, in this case, June-July temperatures, showing how much warmer are June and July temperatures than they, than they uh, used to be. Somewhat paradoxically, one of the consequences of these uh, earlier snow melt is that we're seeing more frost damage. So here's a picture uh, taken at the, uh, looking at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. Uh, this is from the 30, 13th of June in 2001, and it got down to about 21 degrees Fahrenheit. And the plants had already started to come up. You can see they're covered up by snow. And here's another example of a frost on the 11th of June in 2004. It got down to 25 degrees. And all it takes is that one or two nights at about that temperature to cause significant frost damage. These are our temperature data that we record in most of the plots where we work now. Here's some temperatures from uh, this is the summer of 2017, coming into the fall of 2018. Uh, as the snow falls and the temperature drops, eventually we get a snow cover on top of the, the, the ground, which keeps the temperature right about freezing, right about zero, or right about 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And then in the spring, we start to get some snow melt uh, and the temperature starts to spike again. And so what we can do is measure when does spring start based on when the snow disappears. And here's a close-up of, of where that happened. You can see that we start to get, um, this is actually, yeah, this is temperature, uh, a little bit of spiking as the snow is melting. And then one day when the snow disappears completely, all of a sudden the temperatures really jump. So what happened here is the snow melted in April, but the temperatures were still getting down below 25 degrees. This here's the 25 degree line. The temperatures are still getting down below 25 degrees until the 2nd of June. And so if the growing season is starting in April and the plants start growing, but then they get subjected to 25 degrees, what happens? Well, well not all of them, but many of them are frost sensitive and that will uh, kill the buds. So here's a plant that I work with, I've done a lot of work with, uh, it's called the aspen sunflower, or helianthella. Uh, very pretty sunflower. It stands about this high. I'm sure it grows over uh, not, not far from where we're speaking. And I've worked on that plant for uh, many, many years. One reason is that it's attractive to ants. And uh, one question I had when I started seeing this was, well, what, what's attracting the ants? Well, it turns out these plants are secreting something called extrafloral nectar from the margins of these uh, buds, leaf buds. Uh, and the ants are collecting it. It's, a, it's rich in sugar and amino acids. And in the process, they end up chasing away flies like this one that are trying to lay their eggs in the flower heads. And if the fly succeeds in laying her eggs in the flower head, 
then the eggs hatch and the, and the fly larvae burrow around through the, seed, uh, through the flower head and eat the developing seeds. So that's bad for the plant. So what the plant is doing is essentially buying the services of the ants uh, to guard them, their flowers, by putting all their defense budget into uh, that extra floral nectar. Here's a picture of some of the drops. If you keep the ants away, you can actually see and then you can try tasting yourself if you want uh, that extra floral nectar. Because they seem to be putting all their defense budget into that extra floral nectar, instead of making nasty chemicals that taste bad, uh, these plants apparently taste very good to some herbivores, including this uh, pocket goat, or sorry, porcupine, uh, and it's just eaten a bud, and it's about to eat that one, and then that one. So uh, deer and elk and um, um, also sheep really like to eat these flower heads. This is a picture I took at Horse Ranch Park about oh, 10 or 15 years ago, and watch that flower head. <laughs> it uh, disappeared into the mouth of that sheep. Uh, and that sunflower has now almost completely disappeared from Horse Ranch Park. It used to be very common, but I think a combination of an invasive grass, a timothy grass that's moved into this meadow, and uh, the fact that the sheep ha have been eating it for quite a few years now have, has caused that sunflower to disappear from Horse Ranch Park. That's what it used to look like at Horse Ranch Park um, on the way to Kepler Pass. So this is a very common wildflower around the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. Here's a picture of Gothic Mountain in one of the meadows. Uh, and uh, you can see the density of flowers. And note also, my wife pointed out to me recently, uh, there's still quite a bit of snow uh, left that has from the previous winter here on Gothic Mountain, even though this is a picture taken in oh, probably early July. Here's a, uh, next a picture taken from the same spot, same time of year, uh, and where'd all the flowers go? They all got frosted. So the plants are still there, uh, but all the, f all the flower buds were frosted, and, and note that there isn't any snow well, there's a tiny little patch there uh, indicating that, that the previous winter there wasn't much snow and therefore spring came early, the plants started growing early, and then they got frosted. So since 1970, let me check the number that got cut off here. Since 1975, uh, I've done an annual count of how many of those sunflowers can I find in two plots that I go around and count the sunflowers. And uh, maybe you, you can't, you know, well, you can't quite see that there are a number of years where there are zeros. And the frequency of those zeros seems to be increasing. So they, they can come right back the next year and have thousands of flowers. Uh, but uh, I think the frequency of, of zeros is, is increasing because we're seeing more commonly this kind of frost damage. And this is a plot of how many frosted flowers have I counted. These are, here's a frosted bud. Here's a normal. Happy, happy sunflower, uh, and this is plotted against uh, when the snow melts in the spring. If snow melts early in these years with blue numbers, then most of them get frosted. If there's a late snow melt, uh, then we end up with thousands of flowers. So I can already tell you, based on the fact that there's uh, 80 plus inches of snow on the ground in Gothic, that next spring is going to be a late snow melt, and that will delay the beginning of the growing season until after the last date of we're likely to see a frost, which is around the 10th of June, up at that altitude. So, uh, so I'm happy that there are going to be many sunflowers next summer, but it's kind of fun to be able to tell you that now, uh, April, May, June, July, four months ahead of time. The flower forecast is good flowering. These plants are long-lived perennials. so. Uh, I spent uh, quite a bit of time with some assistants digging some of these up, and you can, whoops, you can see how big the roots get on some of those plants. I, th I think some of these plants are easily 75 or 80 years old. So if they get the occasional frost, that's not a big deal because the next year they'll make some seeds. But if they get frost after frost after frost, and all the buds are getting nipped, and you have therefore no flowers, and therefore no seeds, that means the next year there are not going to be any seedlings. And so we did a study 
a calculation of what's the growth rate. Uh, if the growth rate is 1.0, that means the population is stable. So essentially, at the, with the frost, the population is not growing. Uh, in a year where there are lots of flowers, the growth rate is much higher, and the, the population is likely to, to not only sustain itself, but maybe grow. So there are consequences for the, for the uh, ability of these plants to maintain themselves uh, in the face of frost or not. This is happening in agriculture as well as in wildflowers. So here's a picture that came out of uh, the Denver Post several years ago, which says, sorry for the high prices. Peaches cost more because of the late freeze. We had a 70% loss. And now that I'm living in the North Fork Valley, I know how important that can be uh, because the area around Paonia is an important source of cherries, apricots, apples, pears, nectarines, peaches. And in some years, uh, we don't get any of those because what happened? We had what's now being called a false spring. We had a warm spell in March, followed by a hard frost in April, and we lost the fruit crop. And uh, last year, we lost almost everything, but not quite everything. The year before, it was great. There was no frost. If there was uh, very inexpensive fruit prices, and, and all the fruits were there. Apricots are the first fruit tree to bloom in that valley. They flower very early. And most of the, most of the orchard, the fruit growers have taken out their apricot trees now because it's so rare to get a, a good crop of apricots because they get frosted so, uh, so often now. It's also happening in uh, vineyards, not only in Colorado, but around the world. So here's a, a headline from the Wine Spectator about uh, a frost event in Chile affecting the, the wine production there. And another one, uh, uh, devastating spring frosts are expected to reduce Australia's wine production. So I think uh, not only wildflowers, but also in agriculture, we're seeing these kinds of frost events becoming more common and having, having a big impact. I want to go back to this graph that I showed you earlier of the number of flower heads that I counted from the 1970s. And if you look at that, and it's too bad that the bottom's cut off, but it's, it looks a lot like there are cycles going on here. So here's another argument for why do we need 30, 40 years of data to understand what's going on. If I had 10 years of data, which is a lot of numbers for an ecological study, it's tough to get funding from the National Science Foundation for more than two or three years at a time. Um, I, I would never have picked up on the fact that there seems to be at a, about a 13, 14 year cycle in the numbers of these aspen sunflowers and correspondingly in, in some of the other wildflowers. Well, I found a, an interesting paper written by some climatologists who looked at the long-term record of precipitation anomalies, they called them, and they looked at different parts of North America. And for the central Rocky Mountains, they found that since let me see how, what was the beginning date that they, they had on that. Um, from about 1900. So this is about 100 years worth of data. And so they, they found that in their central Rocky Mountains, there's about a 12 to 14 year cycle that's developed in the amount of precipitation. They weren't able to figure out why. They weren't able to figure out what drives that cycle. Uh, they tried looking at the El Nino. They tried looking at the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Uh, but so they said, all we can do is say that there does seem to be this cycle going on. So what I did was to take that line that they found for the Rocky Mountains and cut that line and put it on top of some of my data. And it looks like, in my case, what I looked at was the date of snow melt. What was the day of year of snow melt? And I took eight years at a time. So the first eight years, and then the second eight years, and then the third eight years. And uh, over, over this long time series, you can see that those eight years for the first eight, or for, you can find an eight year period where the trend is this way. And if you keep going down the years, you find a trend where it goes the other way. And there, the line that they found, which is that yellow line, is a pretty good match with what we see here in Gothic and correspondingly what we see here on this side of, of the mountain as well. So another example of why we need lots of years of data to understand what are the natural cycles that are going on? So how, do, how does all this cascade down to affect pollinators? 
Well, one of the advantages of working at a field station like the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab is that there are a lot of other people working there too and working on other kinds of insects or animals or plants or stream insects. And one of my neighbors there happens to work on butterflies. And she studies this um, Mormon fritillary butterfly. And it turns out she had, for nine years, been studying their populations. And it was so variable from one year to the next, and she couldn't figure out what was going on, so she hadn't published any papers about this yet. And she happened to mention to me at dinner one night that her butterflies rely almost entirely on this one species of, of daisy, Origeron speciosus, for their nectar. And it's an unusual butterfly because the no amount of nectar that a female can collect determines how many eggs she can lay. She has to have that energy from the nectar to make the eggs to create the next generation of butterflies. And almost all the nectar that they collect comes from that one kind of wildflower. They're pretty choosy about what they visit. And so I said, oh, well, we have lots of data on, on that wildflower. And so this comes from a project that I set up when I was a graduate student starting in, uh, in 1973, where we set up a, a bunch of plots that are two meters on a side, so about six feet on a side. And every other day, we, we started going out and counting how many flowers are there of any kind of plant that grows in these plots. And we kept that up for that whole summer of 73, did it again in 74, uh, and then uh, we've managed to keep some of that going up until now. So we have 45 years of data for these two by two meter plots. Uh, and this is a, a sort of floral clock starting with spring beauty, the first thing to bloom when the snow melts, and then the willows come into bloom, and then the glacial lilies, and, and then the larkspur, uh, the strawberries, all the way around up to the late uh, gentians that flower at the end of the summer. And those are all important for uh, animals like the hummingbirds that reproduce, the broad-tailed hummingbirds that reproduce uh, in the mountains around Gothic. Uh, bumblebees, like this long-tongued bumblebee visiting a, a corridalus flower, and for that butterfly species. So what, what, what uh, we do is go out every other day uh, and count the flowers in these plots, and we still do that every summer. We've now counted a lot of flowers over the years. And if, if you ever need data, uh, we have data for a, about 120 species for those 45 years. Uh, we also now have 10 years of data for the bees. We started a parallel project in the same meadows 10 years ago. And we've kept that running. And we've published a lot of papers. And people are using those data. Here's an example of what you might see if you tried to say, uh, when do you see the first uh, spring beauty flower, the first Claytonia flower, plotted against uh, when the snow melts. It can start as early as the 24th of April or be as late as the 14th of June. But it's very closely tied uh, to when the snow melts. There's not a lot of scatter around that. And that kind of relationship holds true for uh, just about all of the flowers that we look at, even the ones that don't flower till August when they come into bloom is affected by when the snow melted back in the spring. Another wildflower that you probably have seen if you've spent any time hiking around this area is uh, uh, the bluebell, tall bluebell, Mertensia ciliata. Uh, and something interesting about it, uh, the bottom gets cut off here, but this is on the bottom here is the number of years, or, or years since about 1974 up to the present. And what's the maximum number of flowers we counted in those plots? And so for the first 20 or so years, the number that we counted was actually increasing over time. And then all of a sudden, in the 80s, the number collapsed. And it's not quite at zero yet, but it's pretty close to zero. So what happened to that wildflower? Well, that wildflower used to be pretty common around Crested Butte. And we know that it's not very common there anymore. And I think what's happened is that as the climate's changed, it's now too hot and too dry around Crested Butte. And the plants disappeared from there. And it's now uh, getting to be too hot and too dry up at 9,500 90, feet at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. And uh, that's why the plant has almost disappeared there. So this is one reason why the, the flowering, uh, the, the flowers that you can find at different altitudes around the mountains here is changing over time as, it, as the climate changes. 
So back, back to that butterfly. Here's a graph that shows what's the maximum number of those daisy flowers that I've counted. And it, is, it turns out, is susceptible to frost. So here's a frost-killed bud. And just like the story for the aspen sunflower, that if you look at how much snow is on the ground or when that snow melts, that if it melts late and there's more snow on the ground, you get a late spring and there's no frost damage. Uh, in years in which there's early snow melt, there's frost damage and not many flowers. And what we're able to do is to put our numbers together and look at how is the growth rate of the population of butterflies affected by how much snow there was the previous winter and whether or not there was a frost. And we were able to explain 84% of the variation in the butterfly population's growth rate by what happened to the flowers. And most insects, we don't know what makes a good year for mosquitoes, what makes a good year for box elder bugs. Um, so it's pretty unusual to be able to say what explains 84% of the variation from one year to the next for a butterfly population, just having that background information on the flowers. So that was a great example, I thought, for being able to look at what's the effect of decreasing snowpack, warmer springs, earlier snowmelt, more frost damage, and in years like that, fewer flowers and therefore less nectar for the butterflies, and then the next year, fewer butterflies. So because we did have some frost damage last year, this probably won't be a good year this spring uh, for the butterflies. But given that we're likely to have no frost damage this summer, we can make a long-term projection and say that probably 2020 is going to be a good year for the butterflies. So it's kind of fun, again, to be able to make that kind of forecast about what's going to happen based on our understanding gained over all these years of collecting data. I, I did my PhD work actually on bumblebees. And one of the things that, that a couple of us did uh, back when we were grad students was to hike up this trail. This is Trail 403, the Washington Gulch Trail between Gothic Mountain over on this side and, and uh, Baldy Mountain here. And look at, at the flowers and bumblebees as we walked up up the mountains. We also did another transect out of um, Schofield Park, sort of on the way to West Maroon Pass. So it turns out that we were, we were able to go back in 2007 and hike those trails again and see, do we see the same bees that we saw? And for queens of eight different bumblebee species, they had moved up in altitude about 230 meters, so about two, four, six, uh, maybe about eight, almost 800 feet in altitude, the bees had moved up over the years. So we think what's happening is they, they're, to stay in their comfort zone, they need to move up in altitude. And so there used to be a, a group of bumblebee species that would, uh, we'd find down in the bottom of the valley, and different species that were up here at the higher altitudes. So what happens when the low altitude bees move up and run into the high altitude bees? Either there's going to be a lot more competition and they have to share all the wildflowers, or maybe these alpine high altitude bees are going to get kicked off the mountaintops and go extinct. So that, that's the kind of ecological interaction that's going to play out over the next, I don't know, decade or two. And we're actually going to go back again this summer and try and repeat that study once more and see how things are, are still changing. I told you that we now have 10 years of data for the bees, and we're beginning to put those bee data together with the flower data. And so here's a, from a paper that we published recently looking at the effects of precipitation. How much snow do we get, and when does it melt? How does that affect how many flowers we get, and how many floral days are there? How many days worth of flowers are there during the summer? And how does that affect three different bumblebee species? And it turns out they're not all being affected the same way. So even within the group of pollinators that we call bumblebees, they're not responding in the same way. Each species is responding a little bit differently, which makes it both more complicated and more interesting to try and, and figure out those interactions. A, a pollinator that's quite common up at the Rocky Mount Biological Lab is the broad-tailed hummingbird. And if you look at, <clears throat> over the years, what's the, the day of the year when we see the first hummingbird and when we see the first glacier lily flowering, the glacier lilies are the first thing to bloom, or the second thing to bloom after the snow melts, but it's the first flower that the hummingbirds will visit. They won't visit the spring beauty. Um, and so over time, uh, over the years, 
they're both getting earlier, but uh, they're, they're not changing at the same rate in response to snowmelt. So that kind of changing relationship between plants and pollinators is something that leads us to worry about what's going to happen in the future. If those, those historical interactions between hummingbirds and flowers are changing, and correspondingly, the, the interactions between bumblebees or butterflies or the flowers. If you look at the, the growing season date, uh, the graph up here shows flowering season length over years, and you can see that the growing season length is getting longer. If we take our data and break it into an early section of years, 1974 to 83 in blue, and 2003 to 2012 in red, you can see that uh, the season is starting earlier than it used to. It's lasting longer than it used to. And there, there are two peaks of flowering. There's the early peak of flowering and the later peak of flowering. And as the season is getting longer, that peak in the, or that valley in the middle is getting lower and lower. So this is the time of year when hummingbirds are feeding their babies and bumblebees are feeding their babies. And what happens if the number of flowers uh, gets to be too low in the middle of the summer? So that's another potential possible problem that pollinators are going to face in the future and something that we're, we're trying to track. I mentioned that people study all kinds of organisms at the Rocky Mount Biological Lab. One of them is marmots. And so there's a study that's gone on for over 50 years now of marmots in the East River Valley, and all of them are ear-tagged and fur-dyed so that they're individually recognizable. And the, the marmot researchers arrive in Gothic in the middle of April to try and observe the first marmots as they're coming up out of hibernation. It used to be that marmots, the, one of the, the major source of mortality in marmots was not having enough fat to make it through the winter. So they have to last through nine months of hibernating underground based on how much they can eat during those th that three months growing season. And they come up out of the ground even before the snow is gone. And they look around and they make a decision, should I stay out now or should I go back and hibernate for another week or two? And since the 1970s, mid-70s, they've been staying out earlier and earlier. And that means that they, they're able to take advantage of this longer growing season, and they now put on about a half pound more fat than they used to. So it's pretty rare now to have marmots starve to death in the winter because they're going into the winter with that much more fat than they, than they used to have. If you look at uh, not just individual species, but let's say this is species one, two, three, four, five, so, and so on, uh, and we ask the question, well, if spring is coming earlier, are they all shifting together? Are they all staying in concert the way they used to? And species, purple species here, maybe spring beauty, is still the first one to bloom. Um, and is it still ending when it, the way it used to? And is its uh, a peak still the same sort of relationship it is, as it was to glacial lilies or all species throughout the, the season? Well, because we have all these numbers that we've been collecting for decades, we can answer questions like this and say, are things changing in, in unison or not? And it turns out what we're actually seeing is a pattern more like this, that some species are getting earlier, some may not be changing, uh, the timing of their peak may be changing, the timing of their ending may be changing. So of all these 120 species that we're tracking in, the, in these meadows, they're all doing their own thing. And that means that if you're trying to get a community level perspective, as, let's say as a pollinator, you want to know, uh, take advantage of this community, but the community is changing over time now. And you can't count on the same flowers being there or in the same relationship that it was to, to other species in the community. So this makes it for very interesting times to be studying the ecology of these uh, mountain meadows. We tried looking at how is the poor floral abundance days increasing. And it turns out for, for, for different groups of pollinators, bumblebees, solitary bees, flies, butterflies, and hummingbirds, that uh, for solitary bees there, and for hummingbirds, that there is, has been an, a significant increase in the number of poor 
floral abundance days. So they're starting to run into problems with having not enough flowers compared to what they used to. Uh, if you look at, in this case, let me make sure I'm telling you the right thing here. Uh, this is poor fl floral abundance days related to snow melt. And it turns out that for these different groups of pollinators, um, snow melt date is what's, what's causing these negative numbers for floral abundance. It's not so much temperature and it's not so much precipitation. But snow melt date is very important for 11 of the 13 species we looked at here. So these uh, numbers for how many flowers are available are changing divergently for different pollinator species. So again, if you take a community level perspective, we can't say that hummingbirds are being affected the same way bumblebees are and not the same way that, that butterflies are. So pollinator communities are changing. My first summer at the Rocky Mount Biological Lab, I took a class with a, a professor from the University of Arizona who was particularly interested in hummingbirds. And that got me hooked on hummingbirds and I've been studying them ever since. Uh, he had this idea that hummingbirds, at least the males, go up in altitude at night to spend the night. So what, the way he studied that was to hike up the mountain at dusk and listen, did he still hear male hummingbirds? So these red-tailed hummingbirds, you probably all know, make a whistling noise when they fly. So even if you don't see them, you can hear them fly. So he would listen, did I still hear the males going higher up the mountain? And the next night he'd hike a little higher up the mountain. And do I still hear them going higher? He was never able to figure out exactly how high the hummingbirds went at night to spend the night. A few years ago, we, the technology got to the point where we could actually have a radio, and here's one on my finger, small enough to put on a hummingbird. And unfortunately, Bill Calder has passed away since then, but I, I decided I'd try and use technology to answer his question. And so here's a male broad-tailed hummingbird that we've put a radio on. Maybe you can see the antenna sticking out behind. Uh, and uh, we could put that, that radio would last with a little hearing aid battery, it would last a couple of weeks, uh, and I could pick it up at least a mile away in a straight line. And what I was able to find was, here's where I tagged the mail down here near our cabin in Gothic, and I found one of the radios that had come off the bird up here at 10,600 feet, so a little over 1,000 feet higher. And then the question becomes, well, why does the bird fly 1,000 feet up the valley to spend the night? If you spent enough time out in the mountains, you probably know that there's cold air drainage at night, right? So the bottom in the valley may actually be colder than higher up. So what I did next was to put a whole series of temperature sensors out uh, along from up above where I found that radio uh, down to the bottom of the river and recorded what's the, what are the temperatures like. And so here are data showing how cold does it get during four-day intervals uh, from down at the bottom of the river up to where I found the bird, and then actually going a little bit higher up, up to 10,700 feet. And in early July, it got down to about 44 degrees higher up, whereas down at the ground, at the bottom of the river valley, it was actually below freezing in that uh, first few days of July in 2017. So the bird is, was flying up to spend the night at the warmest place in the valley. Pretty smart of it, right? So I'm, I, I'm now trying to find somebody who can help me calculate how many calories does the bird save by having to fly a thousand feet up, spend the night in some place where it's nice and warm, and then coast down in the morning. The females uh, are tied to their nests, and they nest in the bottom of the valley, so they have to deal with those colder temperatures. Uh, this is actually different, uh, different dates throughout the whole summer, from uh, uh, 11th of June, where there wasn't much difference. It wasn't much warmer higher up. This is altitude from the bottom of the valley up to the uh, altitude where the bird was. But almost uh, all these dates throughout the summer, it was warmer up here where the, where the bird was spending the night. There is no word in the Inupiat Eskimo language for robin, because robins never occurred up there. They didn't fly that far north. Now they do. Uh, 
Uh, robins are also migrating earlier than they used to. And so if you look at when do, uh, when do you see the first robin in Gothic starting in the mid-1980s up until present, they're, they're arriving a few weeks earlier now than they used to. And this is, this is also true for hummingbirds. They're migrating earlier than they used to. So other animals are also responding. We now have this species of Wyoming ground squirrel up in Gothic, uh, which we never used to have there. It used to be down around Crested Butte. Before that, it was down around Almont. Before that, it was down around Gunnison. But they're moving up. We didn't used to have foxes overwintering in Gothic, and they're now there every winter. We've actually had a, a moose a couple of times over a winter up in Gothic now, up at 9,500 feet. Uh, there's a species of mosquito that used to be down around Gunnison, which we now see up in Gothic. And unfortunately, it's a species that carries West Nile virus. Uh, those of you that are fishermen and know about uh, rock snot, uh, we're seeing that happening more often. So lots of changes going on at, at this altitude. And they're not all happening at the same rate. So for instance, here for the early uh, bluebells, uh, they're now flowering earlier than they used to. And ground squirrels are coming out of hibernation at a different rate than flowering is changing. So again, these uh, interacting communities are, uh, are falling apart as, and having to, have to make new interactions. I want to tell you stories about two wildflowers. Uh, this is one called the Monument Planter Green Gentian. And there's a big flowering year you can see, and pollinated by bumblebees. And I studied this plant up in the Alpine tundra at, up above Cumberland Pass. And we've tagged individual plants. So here's one that I tagged as a seedling in 1982. Every, saw it almost every year, where it had two leaves. And then it seems to have died in 2014. But it was already 32 years old, and it hadn't flowered yet. Here's that plant when it was about 30 years old. You can see how small it was. Here's another one that I tagged in 1974, and we followed it for 45 years. And it's still a two-leaf plant. This plant is over 40 years old. Here's one that uh, is older than the research assistant who was helping count it. There's the plant. So we tag these plants with individual tags, keep track of how much they grow from year to year and when they flower. And they have to have at least 12 leaves, or sometimes as many as 64 leaves, before they flower and they only flower once and then they die. Here's one that I planted from seed in 1982 and it took 20 years down in Gothic. Uh, I have some plants that I planted 36 years ago and they're, they're still growing and they haven't flowered yet. So I think some of these plants are likely to, to last maybe 100 years before they flower once and die. And these are some that I planted from seed, and are, are some of them flowered, and some of them are still growing. So I asked the question, we know that these plants have what we call massed flowering years. Some is a big year for flowering. Other years, you have a hard time finding them. Uh, this is 1974 or 5 here. And about every three to seven years, there are a lot of those flowering stalks. I know that these three years were big flowering years, but I wasn't there to count them those years. So one question becomes, what causes these massed flowering events? Why do you get these big years? And it turns out that they preform their leaves. So if you look at a current year's leaf, it's quite large compared to these leaves that are down right on top of the root and inside the current year's leaves. And so this would be the leaves for the next year, the next year, the next year. They have about four years' worth of leaves that they've started making underground. And if you look at what's the relationship between how much rain is there in, June, in July and August, and when they come into bloom, you have to look not at how much rain there was this year, or the year before, or the year before, but you have to look four years back, and then all of a sudden you can see there's a strong relationship between how much snow, rain was there in July and August and how many flowers we got four years later. And this is, this is that graph showing uh, that it took me 32 years to, of counting flowers to be able to figure that out because I had to have at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine flowering years. 
The other plant I'll tell you about is this uh, corn lily or veratrum, and people dress up in that co uh, for costumes for the 4th of July parade in Crested Butte, and uh, I walk on stilts. And that's a, this plant is also massed flowering. This is a picture from over near uh, Kepler Pass. If a pregnant sheep eats that plant on the 18th day that she's pregnant, her lamb is born cyclopic with one eye in the middle of its forehead. So there's some pretty nasty chemical compounds in that plant that uh, protect it typically from uh, being eaten. It has a very interesting root. If you dig up a root, it's rotting away on one end and growing forward on another. And you can actually see annual growth rings in the roots, so you can age these roots. And when they flower, they, they make multiple stalks. And so uh, this plant was maybe about 28, 30 years old, but it had flowered about eight years um, previously. And the, the root had split, but in another eight or nine years, it would have grown past this split. It would no longer be connected, even though they're still clonal plants. Here's a picture from Horse Ranch Park showing some of these large groups. Of, and you can see maybe this one is a little bit different shade of green than the ones to the right or the left. It's not in full bloom yet. And so we can identify, and here, here's another picture of a plant, a group of plants that haven't bloomed yet and are probably a different clone, a different genetic individual from the ones next to it. We know about how much they grow from one year to the next, which is a couple of millimeters. And we can measure how big we think some of these clones are. And my estimate is that th this group of plants is probably about five or 600 years old. So rivaling, coming close to the ages of some of these aspen clones behind them. So until you study some of these individual plants, you don't get to appreciate how long they live how infrequently they flower, and how fragile some of these meadows are. And it turns out we think there is an environmental cue that triggers the flowering there, too. Uh, you have to have a cool summer, uh, unusually cool summer, and then you have to wait a year because these plants also preform their flower stalks. Uh, and we asked the question, is the number of years where we're likely to see flowering increasing or decreasing? And historically, we think about 20% of the, of the years had a cool enough spring uh, followed by the right temperatures to induce flowering and get this kind of spectacular display. Uh, but now, only about 15% of the time do we see that. So, so things are changing. Uh, larkspurs are pollinated by bumblebees and hummingbirds. And how many flowers we see of the larkspur depends on how much snow we had the previous winter, both in terms of how many flowers they make and how many stalks come up. So here's a prediction. This is going to be a good year for larkspurs coming up, which is good for the hummingbirds and good for the bumblebees. So we know the climate's changing. We know that snow melt dates are getting earlier. Flowering is starting earlier. Frost damage is increasing. That's having an effect on plant demography. Pollinators may be affected. And that variation in how different species are responding is going to lead to altered and new kinds of interactions than compared to what we've seen in the past. So the, here's that roadmap I started out with. But every year, there's a different kind of interaction here going on. So uh, every year, we get to, to learn a little bit more about what's happening in these meadows. This is a, a hike over West Maroon Pass. And next time you do that, you'll look at some of these flowers and say, oh, I know something about that uh, uh, monument plant now, and I know something about uh, what's happening with these larkspurs, but there's still lots of stories we haven't figured out yet. In Crested Butte, we're starting to see more sagebrush. One of the consequences of having warmer, drier summers is that we may in the future have the Crested Butte Sagebrush Festival instead of the, the Wildflower Festival. So the uh, Social Security as, uh, Agency estimates uh, that I'm going to live uh, 15 more years. Uh, so I'm hoping to get 15 more data points out of, out of these meadows. And uh, uh, those of you that are taxpayers, thank you for your support for the National Science Foundation. Uh, and hopefully they're going to give us the grant that we've just asked for to study this for another 10 years. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>
So we have time for some questions. I know that some of you may have other engagements, and if you need to stand up and walk out the door, that doesn't hurt any of our feelings. But um, I'm actually going to start with a question, because you just created a segue for it, uh, talking about the value of long-term ecological research and how most of it's funded by the National Science Foundation and a grant, you know, federal monies or, fed or public money. And then sometimes that doesn't exist. And what is the value of, talk about the, um, the value of long-term ecological research from this funding and, or lack of funding perspective. Um, yeah, most National Science Foundation grants last for two or three years. Um, it's very competitive. Right now, they're able to fund about 8% of the proposals that they get. So it's pretty tough. Uh, you've got to be very competitive, you got to make a compelling case uh, to the reviewers uh, in order to get funding from the National Science Foundation. Um, and, but that's the primary source of funding for, the major source of funding for the kinds of research that goes on, at, in my case, uh, or in others at the Rocky Mount Biological Lab. Sometimes we can get some funding from USDA if, if your research is related, has an agricultural twist to it, uh, sometimes from the Department of Energy. Uh, but uh, I've also made use in the past of funding from Earthwatch, an organization that tries to match non-scientists who have uh, time and disposable income to help support a, a research project by coming out and working for a couple of weeks collecting those numbers. Uh, so that, that's something that I've, I've done in the past too. And I just brought that up because of government shutdowns cause all kinds of havoc in scientific research. That's true. Okay, questions from the rest of you. Will. Um, I just noticed that pretty much all the flowers, the plants you talked about were herbaceous. I'm wondering if woody plants follow some of the same trends. Uh, sagebrush, flowering follows some of the same trends in terms of when it comes into bloom in August is dependent on when the snow melted back in the spring. Um, I haven't actually worked up the data on abundance of sagebrush flowering to be able to, to tell you about that. We would probably have the numbers to, to use to answer that question. Um, but uh, yeah, almost all these meadows are full of, uh, of long-lived perennial wildflowers. Um, there's, there's some shrubs, and we have some data for uh, potentilla shrubs. The, uh, I forget what the common name of potentilla fruticosa is. Um, and uh, as you know, the tree diversity is not, not very diverse, and we, we actually don't have much in the way of data, a little bit on aspens. But, uh, and there are very few annuals at, the, at this altitude, too. There are just a couple species of annuals. So uh, yeah, most of what I'm saying uh, is information that we know applies to, uh, to herbaceous wildflowers. Uh, can you describe the change in grazing? Is there fewer grazing permits, and is that affecting the number of wildflowers you're seeing? Uh, most of my plots are on lab property, and we've actually fenced that back in the 1980s to try and reduce whatever impacts grazing might have. But we're surrounded on three sides by National for Gunnison National Forest, and Bill Trampy is the rancher out of Gunnison who has the, the lease for grazing in that area. But he doesn't bring the cattle in until uh, usually uh, late August uh, or into September is when they start to show up in our area. And by then, most of the flowering is done. So I, I actually think they, they have a, a relatively uh, low impact, the, the cattle do. Uh, sheep are a different story, I think. And we're fortunate that we don't have them in the East River Valley. Uh, but they are on, uh, on this side of Kepler Pass. Um, so I, uh, despite the fact that those cattle have been grazing for decades in this area and there, there has been some impact, um, it's, it's not huge. The, the cowboys apparently back in the 1920s used to go out and dig out the delphinium because if cattle eat delphinium, it'll kill them if they eat too much of it. Uh, but they don't do that anymore. And I think the ranchers have come to, to realize that those larkspur flowers are important for the bumblebees that are pollinating all the other wildflowers that they're cattle get to eat. Uh, so I think uh, they don't try to remove those flowers anymore. 
Thank you, David. And for the rest of us here, I know you'll stick around and answer questions um, down here on the floor. And thanks again for being part of this year's Naturalist Nights, and happy spring. <laughs>